Hello and welcome listeners to the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. If you followed or listened to previous episodes, you'll know I like to offer hope by sharing my guest stories with you. You get to hear how they have navigated their own grief, which can be both helpful and healing, knowing you too can move forward after a loss. If this is your first time and you don't know me, I'm Andy Butte, your host and author of Grief's Abyss. And this is part of my mission to help demystify grief. Welcome everyone to another show in our journey of exploration into grief. I'd like to also welcome anyone watching this interview and those that may have discovered us on YouTube. Yep, you can see us and our guests and have a peek at the faces behind the voices up there on YouTube. Today, we are delving into suicide and the impact it has for those left behind and are grieving. It will help us understand this topic a little bit more. And I'm so grateful to have my guest, Alexandra Wyman, who is a grief navigator, a speaker, an author, and she also has her own podcast. Her book is called The Suicide Club, What to Do When Someone You Love Chooses Death. Welcome, Alexander, to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much. I'm just grateful that we can continue this conversation on suicide. Um, it's not a comfortable conversation for the majority of people, but when you, you work in the realms of grief, it's one that you readily come across, isn't it? However, you've got your own story, which we'll delve into a little bit uh, uh, later on. I understand that where you are now, you are now speaking at many conferences and it's You've been at a number in the U.S., and I was impressed. You've actually spoken at one as far away as Slovenia. Did you ever think? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Did you ever think this is where you'd be in your life? Oh, not a chance. Not a chance. Uh, I, you know, I think, I, I think any time there's something major that happens in people's lives there's something that shifts and can you know your trajectory of where your life is going can change and it doesn't have to be the loss of a husband it doesn't have to be something so massive for there to be a change in that trajectory mm -hmm. and I think I just decided that I didn't I didn't want others to feel this was a way for me to kind of work through and potentially help others not feel so much of the pain that I was feeling, which I can't control that, of course, but, um, but being able to get more involved was a way for me to also feel better about the grief process and, and what I've been experiencing after such a loss by suicide. Mm -hmm. I heard the story from a number of our guests, how they say that they wanted to share their experience to support and help others. So I love that you discovered that as well. Were you able to find that it, by doing so, it, it allowed you to step outside your grief or had you sort of worked through most of it by this time? Oh, I wish that I could say that I've worked through most of my grief. I would love to be. I don't I don't even know if that's possible at this point. Uh, but I did find that it was it was very helpful for my process. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things like where people talk about when you're learning a new skill, you can tell how well you've learned the new skill when you have that opportunity to teach another person. Mm. And that highlights that. And this is where I found that, you know, finding ways to help me keep putting one foot in front of the other and being able to disseminate that and talk to other people or to shift some of the stigma around suicide 
it helped me solidify my own process and being able to say, okay, I can still, for today, I can still do this. Mm. I wish, um, you know, and I, I will say that, you know, as someone who's been touched by suicide, I, I have not myself had suicidal ideation since my husband passed, though that is very common. Uh, but the, but it is a daily process. And even when I've tried to speed up that process, I'm quickly reminded this is a daily process. and um, and and to have more patience with it, which is not really my forte. I'm still learning how to have patience with it. It's almost as if, okay, I've had this event. It's been a number of months. I would, I just want to get back to where I was before all of this. And you can either uh, bypass all the emotions and in your angst to carry on with life, but then it catches up with you in some other way. I'm sure you. Oh, yes. You, you can't get rid of it. No. <laughs> and I think that's probably where. I tend to have my frustration of, oh, there it is again, you know, uh, and I and I will encourage anyone who's listening, don't bypass the emotions that you're feeling. You kind of have to sink in and ride that wave because Thanks. of exactly what you're saying. They'll, they'll always come back. In some shape or form. Now, when we were speaking before, you'd mentioned that you'd had a number of deaths, family deaths, even experiencing pet loss and job loss. Did that prepare you for this bigger suicide death loss of uh, the grief that you felt? That's a good, that's a very good question. Initially, I was going to say no, but that's not fair either. Um, I think in some ways that having that kind of loss, and again, it was, it, it was a little farther out than direct. Um, does prepare in the idea of, for me, having a baseline idea spiritually and understanding that things shift and change and people do die, our pets, our pets do die and that kind of thing and having that grief. Um, I don't know that there's anything that could have prepared me for this type of loss. Mm -hmm. Not only was it my husband, he was supposed to be my life partner. And then you add the added layers of the, there's no predictability. It's not, uh, and, and I will say this, no matter how someone dies, no matter if you have time to try and reconcile, it doesn't necessarily change the fact of when it actually happens, that still feels like a shock because then it happens. Um, but this was definitely a shock because I was going along my life and doing my day-to-day -day things. and growing our family and, and growing myself as a person. Um, so I, I'm not sure I wish, or if there is, maybe I can tune into that and, and add that to the repertoire that I'm trying to build to help other people. Mm -hmm. um, but I can say for me, I don't think there was anything really that prepared me for, for this kind of loss. Yeah. How would you say it differed then from the previous loss? Because it was your parents, uh, family members that had died. Um, yeah. So I've had grandparents who've passed and, and have had family friends who've passed. Um, I, you know, being some, there's a, there's a difference. The impact of someone's loss, you know, you can't ever say that the degrees of distance between that person and someone who's still living, you can't ever put some, any sort of descriptor on what that grief is like. Right. Mm -hmm. So for instance, you know, losing my husband, I can't, I can't go and tell someone that they're grieving any less because they worked with him or they met him once upon a time. Cause I don't know that, mm -hmm. but I will say that the difference is that I deal with that loss every day and people who don't, didn't live with him, people who weren't married to him, they may still deal with that loss on a daily basis. It's just different. It's mm -hmm. I think sometimes it's easier to continue on with life. And then a date comes around or a memory comes around and you go, oh, I remember that. And I remember that. Oh, I'm I'm a little sorrowful. Um, but mm -hmm. for me, it's it's daily. I wake up every day. He's not here. I, I have a young son. So I'm navigating my young son trying to figure out how he fits into this world without his dad. So there's just constant and daily reminders that's 
that's different than when it's someone that you're not necessarily around as much. Mm -hmm. I ask, having attended funerals for parents that have lost a child and just hearing the types of conversations that get brought up as you're interacting with people, just the very question of why couldn't I'm sure if I'd have seen the signs I could have stopped it I was just curious if those those types of thoughts kept you in the grief a lot longer so I'm I, what am I trying to say here without a say a parent who died, it may have been a lingering illness, it may have been sudden, but there isn't that why. Why did they do this? You know it was either the disease that they ended up dying from or it was a natural progression of their age. But somehow suicide, it, to me, is... Those has those unanswered questions that the person, the family members get to live with. Is that something you can speak to? Absolutely. And, and I'll say that I think there are many times throughout the grief process where it's easy to get stuck. It's easy mm -hmm. to, to not realize that we are getting into whatever grief traps there are that are preventing us from being able to move forward with our feelings. I definitely, again, am a big proponent, feel those emotions, think mm -hmm. into them and, but don't stay there. <laughs> stay there as long as you need to really heal them, but don't, don't hold on to them, which it's very easy to hold on to them. And the reason why I bring that up is because those kinds of questions are very easy to hold on to and keep us stuck. Um, yeah. I, I absolutely had questions. Should I have done this differently? Could I have been a different wife? Could I have been a different person? Um, there were plenty of people around me, unfortunately, who asked those same questions and decided that my marriage was easily under a microscope. It was, it was, you know, for whatever reason, this type of death made it okay for people to question my participation and how I must have been part of my husband's decision to end his life. I think for me, there's always going to be a question of why. Um, and I, I think though the need for that answer can shift because I think the shift can happen where the death becomes, while it's still around, like I said, I live with it every day. Eventually I think we can transition to really holding on more to, to the person during their life and mm. those things. And not to say, I want to, I want to also be clear that I'm not saying to forget that there were mistakes or things that our, our loved one did, because that also happens. We need to glorify our person, honor them in a way that they never made mistakes. They never did anything wrong. And that's not fair either. You know, yeah. it doesn't dishonor a loved one to say, oh, sometimes they'd get cranky. Sometimes they weren't the nicest or I didn't appreciate, you know, the kind of choices they were making. That makes them human. And I think being able to recognize that humanness and to reflect and remember that person for how they impacted us. I mean, especially for me, I, I like to think of the fun times I had with my husband and the ways that he helped me be a better person mm -hmm. and the things that I can hold on to and see in my son that are just like his dad, while also recognizing there were times that were hard. And that's that's a given. Uh, but shifting away from needing that answer and making me responsible for the outcome, because the truth is we could change so many different parts of of a process for how someone ends up dying or so many things on the day my husband died, I could have changed and the outcome could have still been the same. Yeah. Yeah. And Alexandra, that had to have been so hard. Here you are grieving and people are dissecting you and your marriage. It had to have been you almost as if they were turning what happened back and the answer to their why question was ultimately to throw blame at you. That had to have been really difficult to sort of navigate. Absolutely. And it's common, right? We can't 
very much to the point of we can't speak, right? We can't speak ill of the dead, right? So we mm-hmm. can't, we can't, first we want to blame is in here. And I'm a big proponent of let's take the blame out. Let's take blame out because yeah. there's so everybody, everybody has experiences that negatively impact them and we all respond or react differently. Mm-hmm. And someone, and, and I like to say for me, I believe that true empathy is understanding that I potentially, given all the information that my husband had on the day he died, that I might have made that same decision, mm. which is kind of terrifying, right? He, yeah. People like to create distance between themselves and suicide because it's so scary and it's so traumatic and it's so awful and tragic. And mm. I, I would almost agree with that other, except for the fact that suicide doesn't discriminate if you, and and more recently, and I'll, and I'll get back to kind of having to work through the fact that other people were dissecting my marriage. But Mm. ultimately I recently heard someone say, and I, and I thought this was so true that no amount of love or connection from other people, although I do think connection is big one, but no amount of love from other people can ever outweigh someone's self love. Yeah. Yeah. And if you think about individuals that we know, even famous individuals or people who you know, have been out there more that we know who have taken their lives and you think about, oh my gosh, look how successful they looked or look at what they were going on and what it looked like from the outside. And we love them and adore them, but none of that could outweigh their inability to love themselves. Mm. Um, and and just to, just to finish. So yes, it was very difficult given that I was trying to grieve the loss of, loss of my husband to then have people turn and decide that I must have had something to do with it because I couldn't blame him. He, he he must not be to blame. And to answer that question, you know, mm-hmm. it had it had to have been me because it's something that just seems so irrational. Okay. You raised a point about us not wanting to talk about suicide, that the death, it, it is kind of scary. I've also heard people say they're very selfish. If they had a thought about their family or their loved ones, they couldn't have done that. But that isn't the case, is it? It's not a selfish act that people seem to think. Uh, No, not at all. That one kind of like that one makes me bristle a little bit. Um, Not at all. From the the support group that I've been a part of, from even my own reading, from the grief therapy that I've done, the consistent uh, speculation and idea is that, no, there are individuals who get to this point, a part of that reason. And again, I can't fully answer the question of why, but what I can say is what I've heard and from individuals who've attempted and survived is that I was doing this to not burden those around me. Yeah, that it was in a way, and I know for listeners, bear with me on this. In a way, this was their way of showing love for individuals, so that they would not be a burden to anyone around them because of the intensity of the pain that they were feeling. The pain that they were feeling, and I think we need to say that a lot more. It wasn't deliberate to hurt us. It was the fact that they are hurting so badly that this was the only way they could see as not to be a burden. Exactly. And if you think about it, I was reflecting on this recently about I watched someone who treated a person kind of harshly and that person looked whole physically. And then watching that person react or interact with someone else who did not look whole physically, not Mm. realizing that the person who looked whole physically was actually dealing with a lot of emotional and mental stress, but it wasn't obvious. And I think that's something that happens for individuals. And especially this was happening for my husband, my late husband, was that he was in a lot of pain and you couldn't see it. He hid it. He found mm-hmm. coping mechanisms in order to hide that. And yes, I was able to see some of that pain, but it did not directly make me think that he was going to die by suicide. Mm-hmm. And so it's one of those things when I think of compassion is how can we interact and connect more with people 
without having to be so harsh or make assumptions about people because they physically look whole because we have no idea what is going on internally for people. No idea. And so I think that's right on your point is that no one, while we want to have this magic algorithm or rubric to understand or say, you know, I think I've even had people who are looking for, oh, what was going on in their marriage? Because my marriage is different and that won't happen. What Mm -hmm. was going on for Sean? Oh, but that won't happen to me because I didn't have that going on. It doesn't work that way at all Mm -hmm. because you just don't know the level of impact that any any experience we have in this life could have have on someone. Yeah. It's almost as if by judging your marriage and they're almost attempting to reassure themselves, well, this couldn't happen to me. There's a fear there. Oh, if it happened to her, could it happen to me? So you can sort of see that being another level of judgment coming from the outside. Alexander, there's so much to unpack, isn't there? Yes. And I'm so grateful that you're willing to to go to those places with me. Are you able? Is it okay if I ask you to share a bit about your story? Oh, sure. Of course. Um, So Sean and I were married just under two years. Um, Our son had just turned one. And... Mm -hmm. I had known that Sean had been, uh, he had had a a hard childhood and that there were stressors that were, were kind of compounding on him, but nothing ever. I mean, there wasn't anything. And again, this is why when I'm asked about signs, I'm like, there really aren't any. Yes, there are organizations that say, look for these signs. And if someone is declaring to you that they're, you know, thinking of harming themselves, then yes, follow the the directive of those organizations. but in my experience, there just really aren't as many, there really just aren't signs like that. So, um, we, you know, it was during COVID we were having, it was a stressful time. Uh, and Sean ended up um, just, he had had some, uh, had been with his friends the night before and was having um, a grand time at his friend's birthday party. And then the following morning, he ended up um basically going missing for about six hours. And so I was working on um, trying to find him during that time. And the end result ended up being that I wasn't able to find him and he did end up dying by suicide, not, not at home. Um, And then from then, I mean, there's, there's nothing uh, again, I'm not sure there's anything that can prepare you for for that, that kind of news. Um, and I had a feeling that some, that he had already passed before I was actually notified. Mm. And so there's just something we had a very whirlwind. I mean, we just, we just clicked right away. We just had a very whirlwind romance. We just understood each other. Um, we used to joke that we were kind of the male female version of each other and, um, could read each other's thoughts kind of connection. And so, um, I had, I felt that there was a shift. Um, I can't really explain it. And then about four hours later, I was actually informed that he had passed. And so that just, I mean, what I say is the foundation and everything that I'd known for my life was just erupted, abruptly erupted. And uh, there were some threats of legal action toward me after that, just, and I, and I understand, and I understood then, but didn't really really have that road to forgiveness yet, but there are people out of their own grief who, as we had mentioned, were looking for a reason, someone to blame and grief just does this kind of loss and grief just does, I say, weird things to people. It just makes some of those less loving parts of ourselves come out. And so uh, it took a little bit to kind of get my bearings, although some days I still say I'm trying to get myself level footed. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, I luckily have had family support. My son is, um, will be five this year and we're just figuring out how to put one foot in front of the other from now on. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. For being so close, but you would have that fear, 
that dread, what if? But there's also that other part of it, the hope. He just got lost and you start telling yourself stories. But it sounds like you had a physical knowing that hadn't been confirmed. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I I kind of sensed right away, he, he did send me a text message um, early in the morning and there was just something about it. And I just knew, I said, this is just not going to end well. Um, mm -hmm. But like you said, there was always hope. You know, you don't know until it happens. And so after that, I spent quite a bit of time trying to locate him, reach out to him, um, do all the things to try it and get him to turn around and come home. And and we, we, I just wasn't successful that day. Hmm. When you look back, you mentioned that the I'm sure you've played the the event over and over and over in your your mind that wasn't any signs that you could sort of say oh yeah there were but I'm, I, it sounds like you didn't even notice there was nothing he just went out with his friends and that was it yes I think I think the reason why I see that there really aren't signs is because there could be another person who had the same, who was raised the same way Sean was, who had the same negative experiences that he did, who struggled with healthy coping skills, with the stress, mm -hmm. and wouldn't have ended their life. And so I think that's why it's so hard to say, here are the exact signs to look for. Sure, I could say, yeah, there were times that he seemed depressed, but he wasn't clinically depressed. And that's when I like to delineate because they don't go together. Although there are some people where you'd say there could be depressive symptoms, because I actually have a friend who is clinically depressed and she came to me after this and went, I've never been suicidal. And I said, that's okay. That's okay. You don't. And she felt guilty. This is so weird. This is why this stuff kind of gets me going. She felt weird and guilty for not being suicidal. And I was like, what is happening with all her doing things? Um, so I could, you know, I could say, sure, there was trauma. Sure, there was stress. Um, but there wasn't anything, you know, he did leave a note, but not until the moment, right? So there's not anything where I could have said, oh, mm -hmm. this is what's happening. And one of the things I do want to caution is when we do that, we take the responsibility off of the person and put it on us for us to save them. And that's something that makes, this is why I think people can get so stuck in their grief and, and the guilt mm -hmm. is because we didn't save them. And there's a part of me that's like, and are you supposed, like, it doesn't mean don't do anything to try and help your person. Absolutely do what you yeah. can. Yeah. And if the end result is that loss of life, like that's not on us, you know? And, and that's something that took me a long time to actually start to believe. Mm -hmm. Why do you think we do that? We take responsibility for somebody else's action it kind of doesn't make sense when you boil it down does it but I guess that's all part of the pain the grieving person is in as well or is it the fact that they're attempting to find answers to that why question it has to have been me something I did to have caused this I think I, I think you're all of it. I think it comes down to all of it. I think, you know, wanting that answer, right? I must have mm -hmm. for someone to to get to a point if if the way and I I intellectualize everything. This is um why my therapist still <laughs> still has a job with me because I I the way I look at it is we we hold the sanctity of life. And for someone to get to a point, it's so difficult for us. This is this is my understanding and my opinion, of course. But I think it's so difficult to understand. We start projecting our own values onto someone else to say, how is it you could find that the end, the last thing, the choice that you want to make is to end your life? And we do it, though, without fully experiencing what that person is experiencing, if yeah. I'm happy with my job and my house, I'm going to go, oh my gosh, why, why would you ever do that? 
because mm-hmm. I'm not experiencing the level of pain that that person is. And it's really hard to put ourselves. I think empathy is just really hard sometimes for people. Mm-hmm. And then at the same time, we do put it on ourselves that if that somehow we have to convince someone obviously we want to convince them your life is still worth it. And again, we're projecting onto them. I see that your life is still worth it. And at that point in time, they're not seeing that their life is worth it. And, and so it's just that grasping at straws. And of course there are loved ones. We don't want something to happen and harm to happen to our loved ones. We want them to be with us. And so I think it's just this desperate attempt, which I was right there you know, to try and hold on and keep our person safe and loved and with us. Um, And, and it is hard. And I will say that some of, some of the language right now does perpetuate this idea about saving that other life, get to them and save it. And it becomes very um, kind of black and white, almost like you do everything you can. And if you didn't, well, you failed, you failed because the person ended up dying and that feels horrible, horrible. Absolutely. So again, you're the one being blamed, regardless of of your understanding. And I'm sure that's what it felt like in those early days for you, uh, not fully understanding as you've shared. I love how you said people's values and beliefs come out. Because I don't know when suicide was uncriminalized because it was they committed and we are endeavoring to take that language out of our vocabulary now died by suicide Mm -hmm. is is a a kinder way so even getting back to people's values and beliefs is how they're going to treat the family others in their family, and even thoughts of of the person that did die. Because outwardly, they may have looked really successful and they were happy. How could I have not known that this person was so unhappy or in so much pain? And I think that in itself can be very confusing. Did you find people were saying this? Well, his friends, he was he was with us that night. He seemed fine. Mm -hmm. Oh, and it still happens to this day. I still have people go, why didn't he reach out to me? Um, And and yes, there, you know, Sean was the the stereotypical happy go lucky. And I'll say I think those the really charismatic and energetic people when they die this way are the ones that are the most shocking because people are like, wait a second, we had so much fun. It looked like everything was fine. And I think that for Sean, that was his coping mechanism. You know, if I'm funny, if I'm energetic, if I, then people aren't going to ask me those hard questions or really want to know how I'm doing. Mm. Um, so I, I think that absolutely plays into it. And, and then again, it's just, you're left with the with the no answers of wait, how did we get here? Or there or again, the blame. There must be something. What what shifted to have someone think that this was the the way to go? Yeah. And we'll never, as you say, we'll never be able to answer that because we don't know what is going on in another person's mind unless they share it with us. We can suppose. When you were talking there, I couldn't help but think of Robin Williams. Mm-hmm. A brilliant. I mean, that's a... Oh, so sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. I mean, that was a brilliant example of somebody. He had everything to live for. He was funny. He was successful. Yet there was something deep inside of him that he couldn't couldn't reconcile. There was something that was painful. And as you mentioned, this is a coping mechanism of how they have been. Now, I hope we're not giving everybody who may be listening uh, the wrong idea of if your loved one is charismatic or energetic, that there could be some of this lurking. No, this is just 
Alexander's um, observations of her own experience and mine of Robin Williams. I'm sure that's not always the case, is it? Oh, no. And that's that's the whole point. There is no pattern. There's nothing that we can do. And this is something that with the conference that I went to in Slovenia, you know, it was on prevention and to see the movement is let's get more lived experience into our prevention and into our research studies to look at this because everyone is looking for the one magic key that will just blow suicide open where we can say, this is the magic. This is what we're going to find. Now we can create, you know, a cure for lack of a better word to prevent people from feeling that they need to die this way because of how much pain it causes all of us who are the survivors left. Mm -hmm. And for me, my idea behind prevention is connection. So whether your person, the loved ones in your life are charismatic or if they're quiet, that like, to me, I'm like, stop looking at those characteristics and connect show, like, see them for who they are, love Mm -hmm. them for who they are, tell them. That's where I think the prevention comes and actually more with children. But for, for us to be able to support children with their emotional health, we as adults have to get through ours and start healing. What are those grudges that we've been holding on to? What are the ways that we felt disconnected? How have we felt that we've been wronged and refused to try and repair that? That's to me where the starting point is to prevention, not this magic. Someone is actually like at that point, the finality, and then we're just grasping at straws and it becomes this frenzy to try and save them. Let's try Mm -hmm. keeping that connection. And I absolutely still have guilt and shame. Like, could I have connected differently with Sean? What could I have done? And that's just, that's a rabbit hole I try and avoid because I can die. I can work on that in regards to my own healing for moving forward, but I can't go and fix and change how I did Mm. things in the past. Yeah, that's like one of those rabbit holes, not rabbit holes, the hamster wheel. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Yes. I love that idea that connection, let's look at connections and and connecting to others. I heard something on the radio the other day that was, I need to go back and look at it because the statistics now that there are, we are the loneliest people on the planet. It's it's becoming an epidemic of loneliness, even though we're surrounded uh, by people, we're connected via like you and I are talking via Zoom and all the other wonderful platforms, sounds as if we're losing, we've lost that connection to to each other because of it all. I couldn't agree more. And I think for me personally, I'm trying to be very intentional and working on how can I connect better with the individuals I'm around, but I feel, I still feel a sense or an energy of survival around people, at least that I'm around where everyone is just focused on their own survival, which makes it very difficult to connect because that's, it's almost, I mean, not to go to like a neuroscience perspective, which I'm not technically a neuroscientist. I just really enjoy (laughs) That's kind of one of the areas I really enjoy, but you know, it gets so primal and so much of survival and what I have and going from one thing to another throughout the day that we forget that we're interacting with people. It just becomes robotic. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard to look up in the grocery store and smile at someone. And I'm saying this to you just as much as I'm saying it to myself. Cause again, I'm trying to remind myself, like I can smile, I can say hello. I can, you know, and also try and have energetic boundaries. So I'm not taking on what other people have going on. Um, but I, I couldn't agree more about how lonely and divisive so mm-hmm. many people are in, in how it's just perpetuated this, this sense for people. And that's where I'm like, no, try and connect or at least take two minutes and really care though. You know, when you're asking or connecting, really 
try and quiet everything else going on and be present for, for those you're around. Yeah. So it's encouraging to hear that that is what they're looking at at these conferences that you were at it is bringing more connection. How can we become a more connected society, I would imagine, as well? And it's yeah, just yeah. by talking about this, isn't it, to sort of destigmatize what it's about and bust some of the myths that you and I have been sort of exploring uh, here uh, to stay out of the why and the blame. I Absolutely. And I think there's something about the idea of death, obviously, that makes us so uncomfortable. And I'll say through this process, my spirituality has definitely been pushed and I've had to really stretch my thinking or dive into that a little bit more. I recently, and granted this was in a school classroom for an elementary school classroom, but some kids were were talking about a movie that had a character that died. And the teacher just whipped around so quickly and she goes, we don't talk about dying in class. And I thought, oh, okay, maybe let's not talk about the movie. But again, you're setting a precedent for these kids that if they have questions or if they experience something or if they're they're curious, that we can't actually, um, you know, we we can't allow them to be able to explore that because school is not the place to do it. And maybe school isn't the place to do it, but I just found it very interesting. And I guess that's my point is we're so uncomfortable. It's how do we you know, start having questions or conversations as adults so that we can, uh, you know, again, not desensitize to a point where we don't acknowledge the impact of someone's death on us, but not be so afraid to have a conversation and be able to talk about that impact. So going back to your example of of the teacher that you witnessed doing this, <laughs> She clearly was not very comfortable around the topic. And it's getting people to realize that it's not something to be fearful. You're not going to die if you talk about it. And I think it's in, in the discussions about death, we're all going there. Nobody gets off the planet alive. And to become comfortable is is a way of us connecting to somebody rather than pulling away from them in in the time where a friendly hello or a smile may have helped exactly yeah and you never again you never know i mean how often and i don't know if this has happened to you and but where I'll, someone will ask me something or what I've been doing and something comes up in regards to Sean's passing and they'll go, oh, this actually just happened to me last week. Someone was like, oh, a really good friend of mine, my neighbor passed that way. Like it's just, and it can open up the, you know, ability to connect and have that by not being afraid to speak out or say you're having this. And I'll, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I try and keep my professional and my personal very separate, <laughs> very separate. But I have to remind myself, I still need to find other ways to be able to connect with people because I don't know, it just feels better. Yeah. Or or even if they seem uncomfortable bringing it up yourself so that Sean is present as you're you're talking to the other person and they can then see that you're, oh, she seems to be okay talking about it, allows them to be exactly. more comfortable as well. But it's so sad that the person grieving has to be the teacher, lead the way in, in a sense, doesn't it? Well, and that's something I'll say. I, do, I have had experiences where people are watching me to gauge how they are going to react, which is right, which we kind of do. You know, you want to read the room. But I do, you know, if I don't respond a certain way that people are expecting, then I can see the shift in them. So I, I tell people I'm very open. I'm willing to talk about it. Not all the time. You know, I may have some days I don't want to talk about it as much, but for the most part, I'm pretty open. And I can see their energy kind of shift or their body shift depending on what's going on for me. And so I, for me, I just, I, I wish I could encourage people if it feels right to you, just do it, be able to share and, 
And it's vulnerability, right? That means we're being vulnerable and that's scary. It is, isn't it? Are people going to judge me if I ask this person who's grieving a question and all of a sudden I break down and cry? But that's okay because the two of you could probably have a wonderful crying party just for that moment. And that would be a form of connection, I can only imagine as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Going back to the teacher and her comment, how do you talk to children? I believe you've got a section in your book about this or... I don't, I don't go into it completely. Um, that it's, it's one I'm still, I feel like is still evolving for me. The, the main things that I've heard are be honest, Mm. um, be very factual and very concrete. Uh, kids, especially younger kids are black and white thinkers. That's just, they're very concrete thinkers. And so to be very concrete and I think also letting them I feel like kids can kind of guide us as adults on what they need. They may not fully understand what they need, but can help us navigate how to support them when they have feelings that come up or they're not sure to kind of, again, look for those patterns. You know, I can say for my own experience, there are certain times where, you know, maybe my son is having tantrums around the same time every night and I'm going, okay, you're clearly working through something. Mm -hmm. You know, and let me see if we can maybe adjust whatever we have going on to allow you to work through whatever you're working through. Um, But that is, you know, being honest and being concrete are the two most common things. And there are ways to use age appropriate language to express to a child what has happened to their loved one. Mm -hmm. I would imagine for you, it's sort of an ongoing event in your house you mentioned your son was one when Sean died so there would be little bits released then but then as he gets older I'm sure there's more questions yeah is that where you just answer them the best you can uh yes and also I you know I'm I am not a believer that I have all the answers or can figure things out on my own some mm-hmm. things, yes, and I've had to work on trusting myself that I could that was a big thing when Sean died of, oh my gosh, can I even do this? Can I even be a single parent? Do I even know how to do this? Um, for someone like me who even in my 40s is still asking, like, when am I gonna start adulting? I don't even know if I could could do that yet. Um, mm-hmm. so there's trust in that, but also part of that trust is saying, I can't do it all and I don't have all the answers. So I, I actually, you know, my son has done play therapy. I have tried to um, read other grief resources. Um, I work with a grief therapist now who can help guide me. So I'm looking for tips and tricks almost all the time of ways that I can better support my son and be able to offer him opportunities to start expressing himself. Because as you said, it is, he does have questions. Things do come up and, um, I'm learning just how to respond to him, not react, which is hard sometimes. I have to remind myself that I can do better at responding to be available to him. And I do have a drive to want to try and fix it. I wish I could fix the pain that he is experiencing and the grief that he's experiencing. And I can't do that. And I have to remind myself that, that like, not the best thing, but one of the best things I can do is just guide him through through working through this versus trying to fix it for him. Yeah. And I'm sure reassurance that you're here and you love him goes a long way. And keeping routines, I've heard, is another way you can help support the child. Yes, it helps with feeling safe and secure. Mm. And and I will say, I mean, he has a fear that something's going to happen to me. And I don't, that's one that's hard for me because I don't know how to that's one that I want to fix (laughs) and take that away that he doesn't have a fear. Um, and at the same time, I can't, I can't tell him that nothing will ever happen to me because I don't know that. So I try and do as much as possible to help him with that fear in the moment. Mm. Um, and then yes, to be, to help him with safety and security through having those routines, having some predictability, um, doing positive reinforcement, 
and and being available to him. Yeah, when when he has all the questions, which I'm certain he's not done with them yet. Eh? Oh, I feel like I'm going to have this for a long time. <laughs> when I was preparing for our interview, Alexander, I was reading the bio that came along with your your book. And I hadn't noticed this before, but you believe that there are three phases of grief and healing. And it was the word healing that I gravitated to, towards. And I was curious to know, what do you see as being these three phases? Oh, sure. So the the first one is is the shock and awe. So that's the immediacy of the loss. And that is just, again, with shock comes a primal response from your brain and body. Um, and, and for me, what I would tell people is I was just a shell of a person. I was existing and I needed a lot of support to help with my son in trying to figure out next steps. I didn't, you know, and, and there's business that has to be taken care of right away. I wish there, there didn't have to be, uh, there are things that I didn't even know. I didn't know how to settle an estate. Um, you also have this massive grief thing, but you're not even actually accessing the grief yet because as a protective measure, you're not able to. And so that's kind of that first phase. And for me, it was about four months. And um, for me also, it was like a very um, specific and obvious lift of that shock because I had a flood of emotion that came in that I had not been experiencing. And I realized, oh, I, I've got a lot going on. Um, mm. yeah. So, um, the next one is kind of the what now, so, or the now what, so that's where, uh, it's, you're kind of in two worlds. So you have to start going back to your day-to-day -day routine. You're working for me. I was working. I still, obviously, you know, my son was in daycare, um, trying to figure out how to manage a household. But then I also had, as I mentioned, this massive thing of grief that I had to start figuring out how to work through. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then um, the third phase that I call is like finding the collateral beauty. So that's what I say is that there is a way to find joy again. And there is a way to take a step back from our tunnel vision. And for me, it was like tunnel vision of this is my day to day. I'm just trying to survive day to day. Mm -hmm. And taking a step back to kind of see that bigger picture and realize that there are things left in this life that can bring me joy. And for anyone listening, can bring you joy. Um, and it's just being able to start to see those little glimpses because those little glimpses will start to grow. Okay, so that's what you mean by healing is filling, looking for the the gratitude, looking for the good in what's still in your life rather than the absence of what's not in it, in your life by the sounds of it. Did I get that right? Yeah. It's, it's kind of that combination of, of just understanding that there's still, there's a reason that you're still here. There's a reason why I'm still here and to start to be able to embrace that and look forward to those things. And that absence is always going to be felt, but but the main thing, I guess, for me is this experience will definitely impact me, but it doesn't have to dictate my life. Mm. And and that's where I find that these phases come in is that it is it is a process of healing to get to a point of understanding this is something I'm always going to carry with me and I can still find joy in the things I get to do left in this life where I don't have to feel that my life has to be dictated and I can no longer embrace what's in front of me. Okay, so that's that's what you meant by the three phases. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sure that alone will support somebody if this is their experience because it's the not knowing how long am I going to feel like this I think is the most terrifying. Am I going to feel like this permanently? Because grief, as we know, seeps into every aspect, doesn't it, of our lives? And am I going to feel like this in, you know, five, ten years? Not to that extent, but to me, I, I like to look at grief as being an emotion. We've all got emotions, and those emotions will indeed 
continue on a daily basis, won't they? If we pay attention, it's just all of a sudden, possibly we've never paid attention to them. And here they are all coming at us like a tsunami, isn't it? Mm -hmm. To begin with, <laughs> pay attention to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and I think what's very common among people who research, but not necessarily understood by those of us who experience this kind of grief is that to really heal something now and in the present in this type of loss, it's going, you have to heal the past. And so all the little experiences you've had little to big that, that haven't really been dealt with a situation now in the present is going to compound all of that. And that's what makes that tsunami feeling because it's going to trigger everything you felt before and it's all going to come, come to fruition now. Mm -hmm. And and that's what's so hard. And I recently heard someone and I really liked how they described this is because originally I thought, oh, your grief decreases as we continue. And, and someone said, actually, and I, I, you know, there are so many different ways. So find the way of describing grief that works for you. Um, but I liked the idea that the grief doesn't change, but I, as a person along my journey, grow around it. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm learning tools and I'm embracing life and I am being able to work on myself I grow around the grief so that it's not so much me carrying it I mean it's always going to be a part of me it's always going to be there but that I tend to, to grow around it which makes it look like it's smaller so you're you're growing bigger mm -hmm. I think so. You know, the more and every time I think that I'm like, oh, I got the, I'm solid. I've I got this grief thing. And then I'll have another outburst or something else will happen. And I'm like, no, nope, I'm still growing. And I think that's just the point is I will continue growing. Yeah. And that's what they say. Those is it post-traumatic grief growth? Yes. I have heard that term, which I think is great. It's a bit, it's more encouraging, isn't it? Your book, what and why did you decide to write it? Here you are in grief, raising a child, learning to be a widow, single parent, and you choose to write a book. So writing's always been very cathartic for me. I don't think I realized how much until I actually started writing this book. And initially, what really started everything was if if I could find a strategy that works for me, then maybe I could share it with someone else and it could help them. I'm not yeah. a big fan of kind of the guru mentality if someone has all the answers, because I don't think anyone has all the answers. But if I could navigate this and and really I didn't feel like I had a lot of resources. I was I was given some beautiful prayer books, but I was like, what happens? When it feels like people are coming at you from all different directions, you don't know where you're going to live. I mean, there's so much that turmoil that can happen on top of just the loss. Yeah. And I was like, where, and I'm, I'm a big fan of kind of guidebooks. Not that I really, I don't really read a lot of guidebooks, but I like the idea of like, I'm going through this. Who can give me some, like some information that might help me get through this. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the book, um, that's where the inception of the book really came. Okay, the suicide, the suicide club. I'm sure it's not a club you uh, volunteered for, but here you oh, are. No. Right, exactly. So it sounds like I've answered my own question to you. What do you hope the readers will get out of reading your book that it'll oh. help guide them? Yeah, I think guide and also just, you know, maybe – Maybe this book can give that little glimpse of hope and joy. Maybe mm. this little, this piece can just open up that little bit. Cause I'll tell you, I mean, I was very closed off and yeah. felt, I'm very helpless. And so maybe this can just give a little bit of, of that space to allow for, for more joy and hope to come through. And Beautiful. I like that. Allow a little bit more joy. And that is the name of your website, I understand. And yes. anybody would like to learn more about you because you're actually a grief navigator. So you take people through this. 
I am absolutely available to help. Yes. To help people figure out ways, um, to, to work through this. So yes, forward to joy all spelled out is my website. And then I can be reached via email at Alexandra at forward to joy.com. Sounds fabulous. We'll make sure all that's in the show notes for our listeners and the book is readily available, I would imagine. Yes, but, uh, mostly online. So there are several websites that have it. Amazon and Barnes & Noble tend to be uh, the most common. They're the ones. Are you doing any book signings for the launches? You know, I've wanted to and I haven't. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, it's on my ever-growing list of things I'd like to do. <laughs> um, but, oh, yeah, if yeah. anyone is local here in Colorado, in the U.S., you can always reach out and I can sign one. And you'll meet them for coffee and sign a book. Exactly. Start slowly, eh, Alexandra? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> okay. Listeners, thank you so much. And I hope you've found this information, this discussion about a very difficult and tragic topic can ease your burdens, can ease your mind, and hopefully has helped answer some of those questions you may be grappling with. Please reach out. It's not something to deal with on your own, and you can always find help. And if you're unsure of where to find help, Alexander or myself uh, can point you in the right direction. Thank you so much for spending this time with me, Alexander. I wish you every success. Oh, thank you so much. This has been so wonderful. Bye-bye for now, listeners. Well, listeners, that indeed is a wrap. Be sure to follow us by clicking on the link and you'll be the first to know when a new episode drops. And if you are feeling inspired, please leave a review. And if you are indeed grieving, please know you don't have to feel alone in your grief, but reach out. As a coach, I'm more than happy to chat with you on how coaching can both support you in your chaos and pain without forcing you to endure your grief-stricken world. You can contact me at anne at understandinggrief.com or you can visit my website at Understanding Grief. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now.